All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Woodard Wines with Jeff Woodard. It's uh, June 12th, 2019. Thanks so much for joining us, Jeff. Uh, we'll start by asking uh, why wine? Well, I, uh, I got a pretty early start in wine. Uh, I guess it uh, going back, my story really starts when I was in high school. My sister started the uh, internship program between Linfield and IPNC. And uh, so she basically was very interested in, in wine at that point. Uh, she was only 19 years old. I'm uh, much younger than she is, <laughs> and, uh, so I was about 16. And basically seeing how excited she was about it, I started learning about it. She was bringing wines home. They were gifted to her by uh, people that weren't afraid to give her uh, <laughs> wines at an under, underage. Yeah. So then um, we, um, my parents were really great about letting me try wines at dinner. And um, so basically I ended up learning at a young age about Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, I didn't fall in love with Oregon Pinots immediately. As mm -hmm. I progressed on with kind of building my palate, we ended up going down to Napa and Sonoma. And it was really cabs that got me down there because they're much more narrow focused and it's much easier to really kind of identify with those wines. They're not mm -hmm. as uh, complex and nuanced as what maybe Pinot Noir may be. And so down there, I was able to really see the wines for what they were worth because my palate wasn't fully developed for Pinot Noir yet. Um, so my parents ended up loading up the car with about 14 cases of wine. I <laughs> uh, came back up to Oregon and after drinking those for probably about a year when I was about 17, I remember um, it was Thanksgiving weekend and I met with uh, Eric Comiker and uh, of course I was well over 21 at this point I guess. so uh, <laughs> we were tasting uh, out at his place and he poured me uh, a splash of Pinot Noir and um, I was blown away and I think over the course of that time trying all of these other bigger bridles mm -hmm. that most people can identify with at an earlier point in their with their palate I really fell in love with Oregon Pinot at that point and basically I developed my palate enough to where I was able to see what I was missing before. Mm -hmm. And from there on, it just became a rabbit hole. I <laughs> dove in head first, um, ended up getting accepted to Linfield, and I was a mass communications and uh, communication arts minor. And through that, the department back then was so small. There was like eight people in my class. Mm -hmm. And so it was really great being able to work with my uh, professors at a one-on-one, -one, mm -hmm. and that's what is so great about Linfield. Uh, that one-on-one -on -one aspect that you get to work with them on and I was able to kind of direct my mm -hmm. my course mm -hmm. and I ended up uh, for an info gathering course that we did one of the classes I ended up doing basically uh, Pinot Noir and the sub terrains that it grows within and uh, looking at the three major Pinot Noir regions of the world, which are Oregon's Wyoming Valley, Burgundy, and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all in the same parallel. They're all perfectly suited for growing Pinot Noir. Now, not to say that there are not a lot of other regions that grow amazing Pinot Noirs, but those are really the focus mm -hmm. of what I looked at. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up doing an internship program where I was doing vineyard water irrigation management, uh, which is a long way of saying that I spent uh, summer with a shovel in my hand and uh, putting in uh, irrigation and uh, vineyards. But I learned a lot from working with the vineyard managers, uh, soil types and growing the uh, growing the vines. Um, and then moved on from there and I really focused my efforts more on the marketing side mm -hmm. of, of the wine industry. Mm -hmm. uh, upon graduation, I ended up um, as the director of marketing for Willamette Valley Vineyards. Uh, that was a really great opportunity working with Jim Bruno, who is a very big person in the industry. <laughs> Um, I always felt though as though uh, Jim and I did, you know, we did a lot together. We we're the, the two guys that if you put us in a room together, we could put man on the moon. <laughs> and uh, we always created really great ideas of how to do things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, so I, working with him, I really got a great sense of what the industry is all about and grew it from there. And then I ended up, um, and I always knew working for a large winery like that, that I wanted to go towards kind of the small production. Mm -hmm really, uh, you know, what Oregon is known for. We're, how many wineries now? We've got 750 wineries or more, more. and more tomorrow. And we, um, I, Oregon is known for just all these really tiny producers like the ones that are behind me here. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to focus on that, the little mom and pop operations. And ended up leading uh, my career path in that direction and ended up, um, I think probably about 12, 14 years ago, I came up with the idea that I wanted to have a wine shop at some point. So five years ago, I opened Woodard Wines here in McMinnville. 
and uh, which is really great because I'm the uh, I'm a sixth generation Oregonian, mm -hmm. uh, looking back at my family heritage, and uh, so we've been in the valley here for about 170 years, and with um, here in McMinnville alone, my grandparents both owned stores right here on Third Street. That's awesome. And my, both my parents worked right here on Third Street. So. The, uh, when I opened the shop up, there was a great article, Third on Third. And, uh, <laughs> so it was written about that. So, sure. yeah. So after Wyoming Valley, you went on to Carlton Winemaker Studio. Tell us about how that happened and kind of your role there. Yeah, so I was at, um, I was at Archery Summit, and, okay. um, and things were really fantastic up there. This was right after the recession, and everybody was saying that the only wines that were selling at that point were the $12 to $18 bottles. And uh, went up to Archery Summit, and we were, you know, their wines are generally about 85 a bottle. Mm -hmm. And we ended up selling a lot of wine each month. <laughs> and, um, I think we did like $236,000 in one month in the tasting room. So the recession wasn't really impacting the, uh, the wine industry as the in tasting room tastings go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think that always goes back to uh, Jim Bruneau, again, from Olympic Valley Vineyards. Uh, something he always really kind of uh, pushed toward, you know, pushed on me with a philosophy that, you know, in uh, in other countries like say China, you have uh, you have folks that are not making a lot of money, but what they're still buying, no matter what, is French cheese, and uh, because it makes them feel elevated up into the, mm -hmm. the higher status, mm -hmm. and I feel that wine is definitely that. Uh, you know, people, no matter no matter what want to be drinking really amazing wines. Mm -hmm. And when you've developed a palate for that, you know, before the recession, it's hard to go back. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I ended up getting recruited over to the Carlton Winemaker Studio and ended up uh, becoming the wine director there. I spent five years there. I built the wine club up from uh, nothing. We didn't have one at that point. And uh, built that into a really great, successful club mm -hmm. and ended up, um, really kind of turning uh, turning things around there a little bit with uh, customer service uh, you know hiring some really fantastic people to work with me in the tasting room and then ended up uh, kind of decided to follow my dream after five years I decided that it was time and uh, made the made the jump over here and I uh, got a great spot right on third street so before we get to the shop, I'm curious, you talked about building a wine club basically from scratch there. Mm -hmm. So in your mind, what is it, what makes a successful wine club and what what was it you implemented there that was so successful? Diversity. Um, you know, I think if you look at it from a consumer standpoint, it's really difficult when you have one, one wine or one varietal that you're focusing on and maybe mm -hmm. you're making three different SKUs. And with a wine club, it's hard to do quarterly shipments that way because mm -hmm. you don't have the product for that. Mm -hmm with uh, in regards to um, the studio we had at the time 12 wineries and we had a lot of different SKUs there you had people like Andrew Rich that had roughly 18 different wines he was making each year and uh, you had Mark Wall making multiple different bottlings mm -hmm. and Eric Homaker doing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir I was able to really utilize that and build I think one of at the time one of the most dynamic wine clubs because you were drawing in from all of these different producers and the, the producers there were a revolving door. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't just a set number of mm -hmm. wineries. Somebody may outgrow the space and decide to move on and build their own facility. Mm -hmm. uh, they've had a lot of wineries go through there over the years. So as we get a new producer in, things get to change up for the club members. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you're getting maybe four different bottles in quarterly shipments, you're getting a lot of diversity with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, and then obviously customer service, everything goes, goes with that. But we had a, a really fantastic thing going with that because of the sheer diversity mm -hmm. uh, versus any any one winery. You're getting not necessarily the same wines over again, but it's the same style, same sure. same vineyard, same vineyard sources each time. Mm -hmm. so. Sure. So you talked about customer service a couple of times as kind of a key component here. So mm -hmm. when you're building a building something like this, what are you looking for in customer service? You know, you've always got to be uh, communicative with your customers, with your uh, client base. Um, you know, if there's a, a delay on a shipment or if there was, um, um, you know, if they received a bottle that was corked, you know, it's <laughs> getting, getting that taken care of no matter what you take the customer first. And, and that's something that, you know, over the years uh, and speaking with my customers, you know, they'll maybe share bad experiences with other, other wineries or mm -hmm. other regions that, mm -hmm. you know, in, in general, I've had this happen and never got a word back. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to be really diligent about communicating with your customers. 
So you mentioned that the wine shop was years in the making in terms of when it was your idea to when it actually opened. So what gave you the original idea for this? And then how we, close did you get to? We didn't have a wine shop in this area. Um, there, there was, um, uh, not to say that for that full time there wasn't, uh, there were some very successful wine shops um, here in the valley, but when, uh, when five years ago, when I pulled the trigger on this, nobody had a wine shop in Yant Hill County. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was kind of a no-brainer to me because as, a, as an industry person, I want to be able to drink something other than maybe Oregon Pinot on, on occasion. <laughs> and as, as much as we all love Oregon Pinot Noir, it's great to know what else is out there. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you want to drink a Gamay from Beaujolais or a Chablis or Chenin Blanc or a Northern Italian white wine. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us in the industry down here in the Valley, we literally had to drive up to Portland to get those wines. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of a headache to be able to have to drive an hour to go up and get yeah, a couple special bottles for a, a, a industry tasting that you're mm -hmm. attending or a blind tasting or even just something to enjoy. So my focus here with the shop was uh, was to have obviously a really phenomenal lineup of Oregon wines, mm -hmm. uh, really great small producers mm -hmm. and that's always evolving. You know, I'm tasting wines daily in here, making new selections, bringing new things in. Uh, so, you know, I don't just work with the wines that are just behind me, I work with everybody in the valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, just because something is on the shelf now doesn't mean that a week from now you come in, it's not replaced with something different. Sure. Uh, keeping it fresh. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then for uh, the industry folks, I wanted to have a lot of international wines. So about two thirds of the wines in the shop here are international. Uh, very, very heavily focused on France, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, mm -hmm. Slovenia, and uh, giving those wines that basically uh, a lot of folks don't know. Um, this is definitely a hand sell shop. It's not some a place that you walk in and you say, I'm looking for this one specific wine. Mm -hmm. Because the chances are I'm such a small shop, I don't have that. I can certainly get it for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're uh, wanting to be adventurous, that's where I come in. Because we all get stuck in a rut <laughs> of what we drink on a daily basis, whether it be uh, Oregon Pinot Noir or just Dundee Hills Pinot Noir, or if we want to be experiment, you know, Burgundy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when, when somebody comes in here, whether it be an industry person that's just starting out and learning, or if it's a consumer, I'm able to say, okay, what do you normally focus on? What do you normally drink? Mm -hmm. And by identifying what their palate is, I'm able to make a new suggestion and turn them on to uh, Jaren's own sect or a, something completely random because 90% of the people that I work with would walk in here and look at my shelves with international wines and not know any one of those producers. Mm -hmm. And I think we all play it safe where you look at that shelf and you say, okay, I've had that one before. That's the only one I recognized. It was okay, I'll buy it. <laughs> what I do is I say, no, 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 try this one. And, uh, and I love getting the feedback from those people because then we can build upon what their, uh, their knowledge base is. They're getting out of their comfort zone and they're learning something new because that's what wine is all about. It's about, you know, learning and experimenting with different things and, uh, and not just sticking within your comfort zone. Sure. So how did you go from a pretty decent knowledge of Oregon slash maybe Napa Sonoma wine to a, a good enough knowledge of international wine to be able to stock a place like this? Drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, you do a lot of reading. I mean, you can read every book out there. Uh, you can go online and look at all the different blogs, wine blogs, and learn all of that. But there's really no substitute for learning a region like pulling a cork on a bottle, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's really what it comes down to. I help a lot of uh, a lot of younger younger folks in the industry, whether it be harvest interns or tasting room uh, personnel, mm -hmm. um, helping them expand their their knowledge base, uh, where they'll come in and say, "Okay, I want to learn France," mm -hmm. and really, it's pretty easy to learn France because of the. Uh, you know, you break it down by regions, mm -hmm. and they have set laws. So if you look at Sancerre, they literally do Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. Or if you look at Vol uh, Vouvray, they do Chenin Blanc. Mm -hmm. So once you start identifying that, and it's really difficult if you don't know those things, because it doesn't say Chenin Blanc on the bottle, it says Vouvray. Mm -hmm. So by teaching them this, and then they start learning, and maybe there's uh, little key words on there that identify maybe the style of how it's done, whether mm -hmm. it be sec or, you know, maybe a sweeter style. So it's um, it's really fun to be able to teach those people those aspects of the wine world. Mm -hmm. So, and so what the, what are you looking for then when you're going to put something on the shelf? Is there certain certain characteristics you're looking for? Um, as I said, everything all the wines that uh, come in through here are revolving. I'm mm -hmm. always changing it up to keep it fresh for those that come in and know the wines. 
Um, when I when I choose a wine, say uh, from like the Loire Valley, it's my favorite region outside of Oregon. Um, there's a lot of versatility and a lot of diversity there. Uh, when you look at uh, say Chinon, which is a region known for Cap Franc, what my goal is is to have a a wine, at least a wine that I I view as being the very best mm -hmm. producer within that region. Mm -hmm. And uh, the issue with that, kind of a side note, is the fact that. Oftentimes those wines, I may only get a six bottle allocation. Mm -hmm. So therefore the next one that comes in is gonna be the another that I feel as though is the best representation. So what, no matter the region of the world that I'm working with, I wanna have the very best one, but I also wanna have others that are really great examples of what they can do in the region in different styles. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I'm tasting a wine, oftentimes I, I look at, okay, is this a classic example of the varietal, maybe Cab Franc? Mm -hmm. um, does this scream Cab Franc in the glass to me? Or are you sitting there saying, gosh, is this a Paso Robles Syrah? Or is it a, uh, you know, a Malbec from Argentina? I, I love wines with a sense of place. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when you stick your nose in an Oregon Pinot Noir, there's nothing else like it. And, uh, and that, for me, I think that's how, how it is with a lot of the regions that I work with. Mm -hmm. I want to have those classic examples. So if you come in and say, Jeff, I'm looking for a really great example of a um, uh, Val d'Ost white wine. I can pull one out and it's gonna be a very classic rep representation of a varietal from that region. Rather than being maybe a, an orange wine that's kind of a geeky niche market, you mm -hmm. know, very odd, and it doesn't scream the sense of place. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you know, and then as far as Oregon goes, when, uh, when I'm selecting wines, obviously I can't have all wines that are classic Oregon, uh, you know, the way that I saw it when I first got into the wine industry versus kind of the movement of where where things are heading stylistically now. Um, I've got to have a lot of diversity with different styles. I've got to have bigger, richer style Pinot Noirs for those that are coming up from maybe California where they like a little bit more fruit driven wines, maybe not as much acidity. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I also want to have the polarizing opposite. Uh, wines like McKinley where they're super acid driven, really light, delicate, classic to the region, uh, stuff that you would have seen back in the early days of Oregon. Sure. And I think that's really important to be able to hit a lot of different styles because something that I do for a lot of the people that come in my shop from, uh, from out of the area is we'll have a conversation about, wh again, what they drink, what they enjoy, and then I'll pull together a mixed case of 12 different wines, 12 different producers, and then they get to do a real tasting at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than getting a ounce and a half pour, they get to spend an evening with that wine. So, which is much more fun. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, so tell me about uh, what, you've, what, what are your tips for selling wine? What is it you've learned over the years that helps move wine? You know, I think uh, honestly the, the biggest factor on that is selling yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you've got to essentially create a trust between yourself and your client. Mm -hmm. um, if they come in and you're not very personable, they're not gonna be having the greatest time. Uh, so you've gotta be on as far as your your personality goes you have to uh, sell yourself if they like you and if they trust you and they know that you're not going to steer them wrong then they're much much more apt to come back and or take a leap and say yeah we'll buy this 65 dollars bottle that we don't know <laughs> uh, because that's a big risk you know if you go into a place and you don't know that person they don't know you nor your palate and you're taking a 65 dollars or maybe a case of wine for 600 dollars then you're taking that risk whereas if, uh, if they come in and they trust you. Something that I've always joked, you know, there's three people in this world you have to trust, your barber, your butcher, and your wine guy. <laughs> and um, so it's, uh, I think that definitely plays, plays a part. Mm -hmm. So how do you establish that kind of trust? What is it that you want to bring to the table? You know, again, it's your personality. Uh, you've got to be kind of a, have a great personality, very, you know, be able to connect with your clientele. Uh, my clients that I work with uh, across the country, I do a lot of shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, I am friends with those, with those folks. I can shoot them a text message and say, hey, I just got the new release of this wine. And they know that I'm, know their palate, that I'm recommending that based off of what I know that they've enjoyed in the past. And uh, you know, and a lot of my clients, I'll call up and we'll just have a conversation about wine in general, not trying to sell them anything. Mm -hmm. We'll just, we'll talk about life itself, just <laughs> anything. And it's really fun to be able to have those connections with your people. Mm -hmm. And um, rather than just saying, the new releases of this is out, here it is, do you want it? Mm -hmm. You can call them up and you can have a great conversation and say, hey, I just got this wine. 
I know you're gonna love it. It's a new producer or it's a new vintage of something you you know you've had in the past. It's right up your alley, mm -hmm. and uh, that that trust is a huge factor with being able to sell wine. Sure. So you also work on relationships with with buyers, I assume, for grocery store or restaurant type. No, buyers. so being a uh, for this side of my business, um, I am a retail wine shop, okay. and uh, so I am working with the consumers. Uh, I am not working with restaurants, although I have consulted with restaurants on helping to build their wine lists over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I, my sister, as I was talking earlier, she owns a winery called Retour, and uh, which is this wine right behind me here. <laughs> and um, so she started up Retour uh, years ago, back in 2005, and um, I've been involved with Retour, uh, helping her on that over the years. And then um, together, back in 2015, we decided that it was time that we do a joint venture and we started up a wine called Perry Passu. And so with that business, um, we're equal parts, that's the Latin term for equal parts, it's Perry Passu. And uh, we are equal parts that business. So I have my wine shop, my sister has Retour and Manifest Destiny, her two wineries. Mm -hmm. And then together we have Perry Passu. Now with that side, I do work with restaurateurs and um, other retail locations mm -hmm. around the country. And that wine we do national distribution, mm -hmm. uh, working with a lot of great restaurants and uh, retailers around the country. Sure. So you've been working with that for a while. What, what have you seen change in terms of working with distribution, working with restaurants, grocery stores? Uh, has that gotten easier, harder? What's, what's, what's it like now? I think it gets easier as you go, just because you, again, it goes back to build, building those relationships. Uh, when you have established relationships with the buyer of, a, say, a, a chain location, um, or a, a sommelier at a really phenomenal restaurant, mm -hmm. when you develop that relationship, it's a relationship for life. Mm -hmm. Rather than just going in there, seeing them once, showing them the wine, and then forgetting they exist, mm -hmm. hoping that they buy again, it's, um, you know, I think that it gets easier as you go because of those relationships and, uh, and putting the work into, sure. into that. Sure. So you talked about your sister Lindsay and, and Retour. So what's it like kind of sharing an industry and now sharing a business with her? Yeah, so she also has her, uh, her retail location. Her tasting room is across the street from me, so we can literally throw rocks at each other all day. And um, we have a great relationship. We, uh, we work really well together. Um, we both are full of great ideas all the time. And, um, you know, if I come up with an idea, I can bounce it off of her and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, it's really great to be able to work with her on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and especially now that we have our mutual business, it's really fun to be able to think about what can we do to grow this mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. make it a uh, much more viable business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's great because with my retail side, I'm working with the consumers. Mm -hmm. With the winery side, we're working with kind of the back end of things mm -hmm. with the, uh, the wine buyers. So it's really great to change up uh, kind of your day-to-day -day operations in a way. Uh, you know, you put on a different hat partway through the day and you work with a distributor. And, um, you know, develop those relationships and work the, go out and work the market. We do a lot of traveling together. Um, with, uh, with Retour and Woodard Wines, we have joined up with a lot of philanthropy. We, uh, we go down to the south a lot. Um, out of Atlanta and Birmingham uh, in particular, those are big markets for us. Uh, we go down and help raise money for children's hospitals or cancer research or, um, you know, different museums around, uh, around the country. And, we help to raise money for various causes. And then of course we, uh, you know, we'll hit the road, we'll go out there and we'll do great in-home tastings and you know, she'll show off the Oregon stuff and then I get to take really great international wines or really beautiful Chardonnay from Oregon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that makes it a lot of fun because again, it's changing up your day-to-day -day sure. operation. Sure. So That's really cool. Yeah, cool. it's fun. So you have a, the Woodard Wines has a wine club, is that correct? Yes. Tell me how a wine club works for a wine shop. Yeah, so for a wine shop, essentially what I'm doing, uh, it's much like what I was doing at the studio, although I'm not limited to the 12 different wineries that were there, I'm limited to what is available in the state of Oregon. <laughs> and, uh, and I can also do international as well. I have a, a very customized uh, wine club, which is really fun because people can say, hey, we want to focus on Loire Valley only, or France, or Switzerland, whatever region it may be. And then I'm personally selecting those wines for that one client. And, uh, but with my main wine club here, um, I do shipments twice a year because of the shipping weather. Um, it, the weather can be really tricky, whether it's too cold or too hot. You have two windows to ship, the spring and the fall. And so what I do is I select six different bottles of wine. 
uh, from Oregon, uh, six different producers, and I send out those six to those those people in the club. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a really fun, uh, diverse lineup because they have no idea what they're getting. It's early Christmas, <laughs> and uh, you know that makes it really cool. Mm -hmm. How have you? How has uh, Woodard Wines been kind of received by the Oregon wine community? Do you have people coming to you and trying to get their wines on the shelves all the time, or are you kind of going to them? Or yeah, I mean daily. Like I said earlier, I'm tasting wine nearly every day in here, and uh, I'll taste anywhere between six and 50 wines a day, uh, depending on the day, and uh, which can become overwhelming sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it's really, you really have to because there are so many new wineries in Oregon. It's really important to learn who's out there, who's doing what, um, you know, and what their new vintage is like. Uh, because I, for the most part, I taste everything that comes into this shop. Granted, there's a few wines that I buy based off of allocations that you don't get a try. Uh, but as far as Oregon goes, I taste all of those wines. So I do have wineries coming to me on a uh, daily basis, showing off their wines, mm -hmm. and um, and it's really fun because there's so many great wines out there. Um, unfortunately, I can't work with them all at the same time, but I get to bring them into the rotation. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as the wine club goes, my uh, my idea, you know, in selecting those wines is I'm choosing the wines that I believe are the most compelling mm -hmm. uh, from from where they're grown. So you talked a little bit earlier about sort of with all that tasting, kind of keeping tabs on the sort of the stylistic change of Oregon wine, of Oregon Pinot Noir mm -hmm. specifically. Tell me what you think about how Oregon Pinot Noir has changed and is changing. You know, you'll hear a lot of folks talk about uh, you know climate change. Uh, you know, it's uh, we we're coming coming through a string of very warm vintages, mm -hmm. uh, which also coincides with I kind of a theme that I have personally seen over the years. Uh, maybe others will disagree with this, but uh, critics tend to like a little bit bigger style wines, and we've seen that um, happen in many, many wine regions, whether it be Chateauneuf de Pop or Napa or Walla Walla. The wines that get the really big scores tend to be much bigger, rounder, again, less acidity. They're picking a little bit later. They're getting more flavor profiles. Um, or again, when I first got into the wine industry, there was not a lot of people in the wine industry, um, or sorry, a lot of wineries around here. Um, it was a very small industry back in the mid 90s mm. and as as we jump forward to now we've seen serious growth mm -hmm. and how do you stand out from others you get big scores mm -hmm. and to get big scores when when you have a critic who's tasting maybe 200 wines in a day mm -hmm. some of those lighter style wines are maybe gonna get missed or they're not as loved by maybe that critic so therefore uh, stylistically I have seen a lot of wines become a lot bigger in style Mm -hmm. over the years rather than kind of the classic to me classic Oregon is really light pretty delicate elegant wines back in the mid 90s the wines that we were seeing were very commonly down in the 12 percent alcohol range mm -hmm. 12 and a half percent sub 13 um, nowadays it's very common to see 14 and a half percent alcohol and again that's picking later because you have more bricks or fermentable sugars mm -hmm. so therefore you're gonna you're elevating the size of the wine up quite a bit and making it stand out in a crowd that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that that's good, good, bad, or indifferent, I just have seen that there's been a big shift that way. Mm -hmm. um, some of my favorite Oregon wines tend to be those that are lighter, prettier, more elegant, you know, styles that we saw back in the, um, you know, the wines that I've tasted from libraries back in the 70s and 80s, and uh, they're really fun to try. And then again, the mid 80s, and I have a lot of those in my cellar, and they age incredibly well. So you're interacting with people all over the country kind of constantly, you're, so you're kind of getting the outside perspective on Oregon wine. So I'm curious how that has changed also, on what people expect from Oregon wine, what they know about it, and then what their kind of reaction to what you're giving them is. Yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely a lot of folks out there that are getting to know Oregon as a wine region. Uh, there's been a lot of really great press, the Oregon Wine Board and the Willamette Valley Winery Association. Uh, you know, they've really done great things to be able to uh, reach out to the masses. And then you have some of the larger wineries that have bigger marketing budgets that are able to do full page wine spectator ads that, oh, Oregon's making wine, <laughs> didn't know that. And uh, so people are really starting to know uh, about Oregon as a, a, one of the top Pinot Noir regions of the world. Um, and now we're starting to really get that same notoriety for Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I would say, our, our number two varietal here in the Valley, not by production, but by quality. Uh, there's been a huge jump with, um, with Chardonnay recently. Mm -hmm. and, um, and turning people onto those, and it's really great. Again, I was 
talking about my sister Lindsay and I going out doing these travels when uh, when we do a blind tasting with uh, a room full of 30 people and I'll have maybe a really great white burgundy and two Oregon Chardonnays in there and uh, and th everybody thinks they're all burgundy and uh, that's not that we're trying to mimic burgundy but let's face it that is the greatest region for Chardonnay internationally so uh, the fact that Oregon is really keeping up I think in that regard uh, people are starting to understand that and it's uh, it's a really cool thing to see the growth of Oregon with that as well as the uh, continued growth of Pinot Noir so and I think as far as uh, style goes you know people look at uh, look at Oregon as uh, being making much more affordable wines than say Burgundy uh, Burgundy is an amazing region but you definitely pay for Burgundy um, you know as yields are getting smaller and smaller over the years due to uh, mother nature uh, they've had a lot of weather events that have uh, reduced yields down. The price of the wines can continually uh, climb with those. Um, and we're obviously seeing a lot of uh, the Burgundy houses coming to Oregon buying land. Because mm -hmm. everything that's plantable there is already planted. Mm -hmm. Here in Oregon, we've scratched the surface. And uh, that's all we've done so far. So we have a lot more growth potential here in the valley. Uh, you know, for vineyard lands, I think the best vineyard in Oregon hasn't even been planted yet. Mm -hmm. So... Something to look forward to. Something to look forward to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you found more people coming into you with more knowledge of Oregon wine and more like, more uh, asking for spe spe specific? <laughs> asking for specific sellers, especially smaller ones? Definitely. Um, you know, when you, when you have somebody come in from, uh, from elsewhere, uh, say the Midwest or the East Coast, when they come in here, they only get at home from their local uh, wine suppliers, they're only getting a very small view of what Oregon is. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's a little bit larger wineries, so they're reading about wines. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll read about, uh, say, Sequitur, and, uh, which is a wine that it's fairly hard to get, mm -hmm. or Hundred Sons or Retour, wines that don't get a lot of distribution. And they're coming in here and they're saying, listen, I just read this article, I've got to get some of this, and of course I can set them up with those wines. Mm -hmm. but, um, but then I think the, the fun part of that is turning them on to the wines that, uh, like Hundred Suns, something you, that's so brand new that you may not read about it in the publications. Mm -hmm. You can really turn them on to these great new producers, and uh, the only way they're going to learn about them is by coming out here and or having somebody that's boots on the grounds, uh, you know, tasting all of these wines. Sure. So you mentioned earlier that you're a Linfield graduate. We yes. always like to talk to Linfield graduates, of yep. course. Um, how would you, how does Linfield education influence your, your career? You know, as I was saying earlier, you know, being such a small department that I was a part of, and in, in general, all of the departments at Linfield are very small class sizes. So um, that was really great because I was, again, able to steer my focus in one direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, the head of my department, Dave Gilbert, at the time was really phenomenal. And and giving me the reins to do as I kind of wanted, <laughs> and um, so a lot of my st a lot of my focus was again on wine and marketing of wine, uh, learning about different regions of the world, and um, so Linfield was really amazing in the sense that um, it's right here in the Willamette Valley. When I first started writing my very first research paper on Pinot Noir, I ended up meeting with Jimmy Brooks, who was also a communication major at Linfield. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, uh, as, I, as far as I know, the very first person from Linfield to go into the wine industry, mm -hmm. uh, followed by my sister and then myself and then Davin McNeil. And uh, mm -hmm. we were the first basically four people in the wine industry from Linfield that I know of. And uh, meeting with Jimmy and uh, seeing his passion for um, wine in general, you can't say Pinot Noir because I think Riesling was probably his biggest, biggest passion, mm -hmm. but um, learning from him and seeing how enthusiastic he was about this re this region and the potential of this region. He was an unbelievably helpful person. Um, you know, he gave me so much knowledge, and also by default the passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I've obviously got that from my sister as well. Sure. And I got a lot of help from her, and then Michael Stevenson, and uh, there was a lot of a uh, lot of folks. And then I was able to tap into the resources of the Ponzi's, and uh, you know, meeting all of the old guard, the original pioneers of Oregon. And, uh, and getting to know more of the Oregon history of what, why, when, and how. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was invaluable. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about changes you're seeing now kind of in Oregon wine. Uh, and you, again, have a really interesting perspective on this. So I'm curious what you see as you look forward in Oregon wine, say the next 10, 15 years. There's a lot of growth, obviously, in Oregon. As I was saying, back in the mid-90s when I got involved in the industry, you know, there was just a, a small handful of wineries. There was a lot more than there was in the 80s, obviously. <laughs> but as, we, uh, as we've grown since then, 
uh, we've seen this huge shift and uh, a big focus where larger wineries, whether it be Burgundy or Napa or uh, just California in general coming here, um, I think it all started with Chateau Saint Michel mm -hmm. um, coming into the valley and that created a lot of controversy. There was a lot of people that were saying, no, 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 this isn't a good thing for the valley. And you know, with Kendall Jackson, uh, the Jackson family mm -hmm. coming into Oregon, um, it's amazing. It's, uh, they're dumping a lot of resources, they're dumping a lot of money into this industry. And again, uh, I hinted on this earlier, the larger wineries are able to market us as a whole. They're not just marketing themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when you read about an Oregon winery, it's Oregon as a whole they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it goes back to a rising tide, uh, it raises all the ships. And I think that's a really important thing to get these, this, uh, uh, these larger wineries that have maybe better capabilities because of their financing mm -hmm. to be able to really do what maybe we can't do with Perry Passu and uh, because we're a tiny winery. Mm -hmm. So you're very limited on that. So it's, uh, it definitely helps spread the word out there. Uh, it, helps, it helps all the new, or the, the old guard really uh, kind of focus on their point that this is one of the world's greatest regions for Pinot Noir and now Chardonnay, <laughs> so. Sure. Do you see, uh, in terms of on the marketing side, or not the marketing side, but in terms of like this kind of the scale of Oregon wine, what do you see happening? Do you see growth at the rate it's going now? Do you see consolidation? What do you think? When you, when you look at the overall, uh, overall numbers of the United States as a wine producing country, um, California still makes about 98% of all the wines that are made in the U.S. I believe that there are still tanks in California that can hold all the wine that's made in Oregon in one tank. Um, Washington makes about 1% of that, of that big picture. They, so it's 98% California, 1% Washington. The rest of the states, which all 50 states make wine, 49 make wine out of vinifera grapes. Mm -hmm. Cal uh, Alaska being too cold to grow vinifera grapes. Um, so 49 re states are sharing, er, sorry, the remaining states mm -hmm. are sharing that 1%. Mm -hmm. And um, so we are barely a drop in the bucket, quite literally. And uh, so people say, oh my gosh, there's so many vines going in here. There's so much wine being made. At some point, we're gonna flood the market. And we're really not, because again, Oregon is getting much more notoriety. Uh, there are still people throughout the country that don't realize that Oregon is making wine, mm -hmm. that drink wine on a fairly regular basis, mm -hmm. that once they tap into Pinot Noir, they're inevitably gonna land on Oregon mm -hmm. as you know, they're maybe daily, daily drinker Pinots or what they're collecting for their cellar. And uh, so we're seeing, I think the growth in, the growth of what we're doing in Oregon is gonna keep up with the growth and demand of what, what we're doing here and as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not too worried about flooding the market. Um, we definitely have a lot more land that we can plant, but we are still gonna be a tiny region. A um, hundred years from now, we will not be what Napa is. Uh, people always kind of go back and say, well, this is basically what Napa was back in the 70s, and, uh, which is a really small kind of, uh, kind of a region where it's you know, family-owned wineries and uh, everybody's helping each other, and that's very much what Oregon is. It's a lot of really tiny wineries. We're all helping each other out. Um, you know, if, uh, there's so many stories that go back where during harvest, a uh, press goes out and the neighbors show up with a press and say, go ahead and use this, or a sorting table and a uh, forklift goes down. They're, we're all there to help each other out, and, uh, and that's very much the way that Napa was and is still that way as well. But um, we're not this huge wine region um, that's kind of competition, or we're not competition for our neighbors mm -hmm. in that regard. We're, we're all helping each other out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it's gonna continue on that way even much farther down the road. Do you have any concerns as you look into the future? You talked about obviously climate change a bit earlier. <clears throat> Is there anything else that you see that kind of a cloud on Oregon's horizon? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting uh, that you bring that up. When you look at, uh, I think a lot of the, uh, uh, <laughs> people, very, people are very nervous about you know, global change, weather, climate change. And uh, we hear a lot of that talk here in Oregon. They're saying, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Though it's very arguable when you look at the scores and also the sales of Oregon that we're making some of the best wines we've ever made now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of learning how to farm uh, controlling your uh, your crop load in the vineyard, mm -hmm. that's a very, very big aspect. We are still farmers in Oregon. Uh, no matter how big of a winery you are, you're still farming. And it really comes down to um, kind of adjusting maybe your strategy on any given year. Mm -hmm. um, who knows, next year maybe back to what 2010 or 11 were, which are the two of the coldest years we've ever seen. And um, 
So I don't get too excited. Uh, I'm not alarmist with the, the weather patterns that we're seeing right now. Yeah, we've, we're in a string of very hot vintages, but at some point we're gonna probably balance out and it's gonna cool back down and or it's gonna continue to be very hot and we're gonna continue to make really amazing high scoring wines that sell to the masses and the collectors. And I think that's, uh, that's a big thing. There's, um, there's a lot of new wineries here in the Valley that are um, maybe adjusting kind of the, uh, the picking philosophies. They're picking earlier uh, where they're getting natural acidity. They're not as worried about the flavor development. Um, so they're maybe com combating a little bit of the, uh, the hotter vintages that way because acidity is very important in, in wine. And um, if, you, if you hold it out there until you get to the right bricks level, on certain vintages where you have very hot nights, that's gonna be a big factor with your acid levels and then um, you know you may have to add acid. There's a lot of tricks winemakers can, can do to maybe change the style of vintage, but yeah, I'm not too concerned. Sure. So what about you personally as you look into the future? You obviously have the shop, you have mm -hmm. your, you join business with, with your sister. What are, you, what are you looking as you see 10 years down the road for yourself? Building, uh, building Perry Passu, um, our winery, building that larger, and then um, you know, with the wine shop, this is really fun. Um, my biggest focus, I think, with being in the industry is education. Um, helping to educate, um, whether it be consumers or industry people, uh, really trying to fill them with knowledge uh, that I've been lucky enough to gain over the years by drinking amazing wines from all over the place and reading a lot. Um, sharing that information with people is, is really important to me um, because again, I, and I think we're all guilty of it, getting stuck in the rut of what we drink. You know, the more knowledge you have, the more you want to venture out and try those wines that you're reading about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so having this wine shop, being able to do that, that's probably the biggest gratification I have in this industry. Anybody have a question? So um, I thought it was interesting that you were talking about how like no one really, a lot of people don't often know about Oregon wine and that was me until I came to Oregon. And so I was kind of curious about why you think um, wine is so important to culture and society as a business owner and someone who is also passionate about wine. Like what does it do for people um, compared to like other beverages? Like why is this so important to tell this story and preserve it? You know, and I'm sure that the same could be said for any, any alcoholic beverage out there um, you know the um, but with wine it's definitely there's one goal with wine um, you know and I think a lot of people lose that that picture over um, um, essentially they think that wine is meant to collect and or brag about what you maybe have in your cellar there's a lot of very big collectors and I hate the word connoisseur because that is the epitome of what I'm talking about um, but the people that basically have lost the f lost focus of what wine is. Wine is meant for one thing, and it's enjoyment. Um, you know, you may enjoy it by yourself. After a long day at work, you go home and you pour yourself a great glass of wine. Uh, but it's generally shared with friends, great conversation, great, great meals, breaking the bread together uh, at the table. And uh, again, you can say that about a lot of other things, but wine is definitely that one element, especially champagne, the biggest celebration uh, beverage out there. Um, you know, every, every major moment of your life, you should be drinking champagne. And um, so I think that, um, you know, people throughout, people throughout the U.S., they're getting to know Oregon. They're getting to know that this is one of the greatest regions, quite literally, for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay out there and a host of other varietals. But um, the more they dig into wine and the more they are drinking wine, the more they're gonna start shifting their palates towards Pinot Noir. The evolution of wine, oftentimes people start off with really sweet white wines. They migrate into maybe drier style whites. Then they go to bigger Zins and then Cabernet and Merlot and then jump through all the different red blends. Then they land on Pinot Noir. And that is because, as I was saying, my personal experience, once you gain your palate and you start learning more about um, the varietals and you can pick out those subtle nuances, the more you're gonna to migrate towards those lighter, more delicate wines. And I think of, oftentimes people also migrate towards more white wines that are much more interesting and back to Riesling, although it's maybe drier style Rieslings at that point, because mm -hmm. they're very interesting. But um, people are inevitably gonna land on Oregon at some point throughout their, um, their, their learning curve, so. I'm fortunate to have done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very, very common for people. I started off with reds. I didn't drink white wine until I was 26, so. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I went totally, uh, totally um, backwards on that. My, uh, my, basically everything that I cared about 
with wine, all of my knowledge, all of my reading and studies of wine was all on red wine. And, um, and I remember I tried a, uh, tried a Riesling, a German Riesling, and uh, when I was 26, and I'd had plenty before then, I never loved them and never cared much about them, and then all of a sudden it, I went down a rabbit hole and probably about 80% of what I drank now is white wine. That and rosé, so that <laughs> probably makes up about 80% of what I drank, so. Jimmy, Jimmy would be proud of you. Yes, Jimmy would be very <laughs> proud, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Oh. So everybody's got questions. Everybody's got questions. Got Great. Bring them. So considering your involvement with Linfield and the fact that you're still in McMinnville and you're very central in McMinnville, mm -hmm. um, can you, if you can, explain a bit about how IPNC not only affected your time at Linfield, but then your time afterwards, considering that it's such a big thing and it brings a lot of attention to McMinnville? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, every year we have about 800 people that come from around the world to to Linfield, to McMinnville, to seek out the greatest Pinot Noirs of the world. And all of these wineries from around the world are coming here to showcase them. Um, it's a really great celebration. It's a really great time to learn more, uh, to dive in deep and learn more about, about Pinot Noir and different regions, soil types, everything. Um, my experience with Linfield, again, my sister started the internship program between Linfield and IPNC. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she did that, uh, I basically was able to go to the Salmon Bake, which is uh, the big dinner on Saturday night. Uh, I think it's about 1,500 people that attend that now, uh, so it's a very, very large event. And uh, I was able to go there and really, really get um, so much knowledge from people that had far greater knowledge than I did. Um, I remember an experience, and this will always stay with me, um, this was my first absolutely amazing experience with wine, and it was uh, it was a really cool moment. There was a 1958 Burgundy, and I was 16 or 17 years old, so I don't recall the producer. But uh, there was a gentleman that opened the bottle up, and um, he right before he pulled the cork the rest of the way out, he had about eight people standing around in a circle, and he told us what was going to happen. He said, I'm going to pour this to for each of you. I want you to immediately look at it, smell it, taste it, look at it again, smell it, and taste it. And uh, he said, you're gonna see a big big thing change. And uh, this was a really great opportunity because I had never had a wine nearly that old. And um, I looked at the wine and it had this beautiful color to it. I smell it. It was absolutely an amazing, beautiful wine um, across, the, uh, across the nose. I tasted it, it was very lively and not necessarily fresh, but it was very lively. I looked at it, it turned brick, it went to brown, I smelled it and it was dead. And it happened in a matter of 15, 20 seconds. And, uh, and I, that really was a cool opportunity because I was obviously quite young. Um, getting an opportunity to see how much wine can change like that, that it's a living, breathing thing, that really hooked me. And uh, that was a big moment for me. Uh, but then over the years with IPNC, I, um, I don't recall what year this is now. It's uh, 30, Two. 32, 32 years. 32, and, yeah. um, I've been, I've attended probably like 23, 24 of those, and uh, which is really, uh, really fantastic to be able to go there and be a part of that and see a lot of the same faces and get, get to be very good friends with a lot of the uh, uh, producers from elsewhere. And um, so that's, uh, it's a very important thing for our industry because it's obviously getting the word out there even more, uh, being the largest Pinot Noir celebration in the world. And it's been going on for 32 years. It's amazing. Good, okay. All, all the questions we have prepared for you. Uh, is there yeah. anything else we should have asked? Anything else you'd like to talk about here at the end? Uh, I think that probably is, yeah. All right. I think we covered it. Okay, well, excellent. So. Thank, thank you so much for your time and for your answers and for yeah. all your candor, and uh, we'll let you off the hook. Yeah. <laughs>